Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started this evening. Okay, we're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to continue with the whole flow of really taking buildings and working with them as conceptual masses. Look at kind of the some of the variations that you might run into where we can really start to understand the nuance of where we would like to use conceptual masses and the ability to create form out of the conceptual masses versus building things up from scratch, building them out of true rather than building elements, where those two worlds sort of come together and how in some ways you really end up in the same place, but the types of elements you create, whether you create them from masses or by building them from scratch, can have slightly different properties you need to be aware of. So we're going to spend some time up front just kind of looking at this whole workflow of conceptual masses and turning into building elements. Now we do kind of this top level sort of design. Um, this will all be preparing you for the next assignment, which I think Lottie was drafting up today or something like that. We hope to get it out like tomorrow morning. Tomorrow. Something like that. And you will have until next Tuesday to go ahead and work on this. Okay, very good. So it's the second to last assignment. The last assignment will actually pass out next week. Just so you know, I've got that the tail end of the course. Um, there is no final new course. Uh, that we actually wrap up right after Thanksgiving, the week after Thanksgiving, our final week of classes. So within that week, you'll be presenting your results of the last assignment that we'll be passing out. And you'll have over the Thanksgiving break to go ahead and finish it up, which will involve kind of coordinating work from a lot of different disciplines. But we'll look at this conceptual workflow and really how we can uh, like take advantage of that and use it for this assignment in the first half of class. In the second part of class today, we're going to look at buildings really as a series of different systems that all have to work together. So beyond just sort of understanding their overall architectural form, but to really take them apart and understand that, you know, there are a number of different systems that are kind of, you know, buildings in some way are very much like human bodies in that the organisms, lots of different systems have to work together. There's a skeletal system, which is the structure, which holds everything up and kind of keeps everything supported. But there's also a number of different systems for supplying needed services to go through and you know, keep the building functioning. So we were talking about, oh, mechanical systems like uh, air handling equipment that take care of ventilation. We'll talk about plumbing systems and piping systems that actually get the fluids either to where they're needed or moved away from where they're needed. Electrical systems, all these different systems that have to work together. So we're going to really start to learn to start thinking about a building as really being an organism that really has all these different systems working together and really think about who's responsible for designing all those different systems and ultimately, how we coordinate the work of all those different designers. Because in a building of any scale, like not a single designer will go through and take care of all those systems. It's really a number of different people working together who may not even be part of the same company. They may be working for separate consultants that are coordinated as part of the project team. And getting all their work to add up in a very positive, additive way is a lot of our work to make that happen. But there's kind of order and a system to make that happen a little bit better. But let us start with just the conceptual stuff, the conceptual massing stuff, and get going with that. And hopefully this will reinforce things that you need, like uh, for this assignment that's coming up. As we open up Revit here, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about this whole notion of the conceptual masses and really what we're creating with the conceptual masses. So let me just open up a new project, architectural template. And hopefully this first part will start looking very familiar, so I'll apologize if it feels, feels a little bit repetitive, but it's going to be a very similar setup for oh, most of the projects we sort of approach from right now, here on out. We always start with this notion of really what the floor-to-floor -floor height is. So, again, 10 feet sort of a very narrow amount of space. You know, for a commercial building, 12 feet to 15 feet is probably much more common. So I'll just make it 12 feet for now because we're not only trying to accommodate the space that we can see, the architectural space, we also have to account for all the space between the floors that's taken up by the structure, the ductwork, the piping, all those different things which are sort of transparent or relatively invisible to us, but we have to allow room for them. And yeah, you know, that whole issue of the floor to floor height and how we accommodate things in that little bit of space, that turns out to be really where almost all of our coordination hassle comes from. In the eight feet of space or the 10 feet of space we can see here, pretty well coordinated, there's really not a whole lot of hassle. But up in those two or three feet above the ceiling plane, it's a whole lot of people trying to run a lot of stuff through a very constrained uh, amount of space. And that's where we get into all the troubles later on. 
So I'm going to add a couple more levels to this. I'll just pick this. I'll use my offsetting to do that pretty quickly. So I'm going to make some more levels at 12 feet. I will, let's go ahead and offset that one. We'll offset again. Oops, I went down instead of up. I'm going to control Z and undo that. Let me go back to that offsetting again. 12 feet. I'll hover ever so slightly. You can't see me hovering because it's kind of showing up above the space. So I think that's what's going on. It's like I'm always like a mouse click behind. I'm not sure what that's all about. Okay, up to level five. So I got some basic spaces to work with here. Okay, once I've created those basic levels to work with, I can start placing uh, something that looks like the mass of the building. And as I go through and do that, most of it's happening under the massing inside tab. So I'll start with just sort of a very basic sort of mass, just to kind of oh, start basic and build up. So I'm going to say, make some sort of mass. It'll complain that it wants to make these things visible, and they're typically not. I'll say that's fine. Now we can start drawing some profile. And what I've been drawing so far have tended to be, oh, these very simple like rectangular profiles. So I'll pull that out there. There's my little rectangular profile of the building. Now, there's nothing that says the profile has to be that basic. I'm going to think about why this is. I'm, I'm like always a mouse click behind. Okay. Within that, I can also go through and, oh, kind of draw a line like this, which is chopping off a piece of that. And then I can trim up those different spaces. For example, if I want to cut off the corner of that building, yeah, I can just use the trim tools. So I'll say modify. There's my trim tool. Then choose this versus that, and this versus that. And I'll have something that's, oh, kind of like this five-sided shape. Just rotate that to 3D. Okay, so far I just have a profile. That's just a profile from which I'm going to extrude some shape. So it always starts with just choosing that profile. You can say create a form. Now notice there's actually two choices here. There's a positive solid form and a negative void form in there. We'll stick with positive. We're going to come back and visit voids in just a second. OK, that's only about 30 feet tall right now. I can stretch that up. But in the workflow we've been using, it's pretty straightforward to move from here. I can say, let's go ahead and finish that mass. Okay. Currently, it's still just a big old mass, so it has volume, but it doesn't have the floor levels assigned to it. I have to choose that mass and just add the floor levels to it. Okay, now we actually have something which is getting a little bit closer. Now, this building over here that has, or the soon-to-be building that has four different levels to it, yeah, it actually does have some notion of the amount of square footage in the building. For example, if I click on the mass, you'll see that the gross floor area is reported about 17, almost 18,000 square feet in there right now. So if I needed to have some more square footage, the idea is, of course, that I could kind of stretch and pull these different surfaces, kind of start reshaping this, whatever it is that I need to do. That's actually extending it down into the basement. It's hard to do this in 3D sometimes. This is the handle I want. Okay, stretch the shape out there. But what I've been doing so far is just kind of creating, these are all sort of vertical surfaces now. That's the important thing to realize about them. They're all still vertical at this point. If I want to start tallying up the area that's in here, you can think about how the different floor levels can have different usages. For example, I might want to have retail on the first and second floor, then office on the third and fourth floor, second or third. That's right. I can assign uses to each of those different spaces. Turns out mass floors have usages to them, or that's usage is one of the variables that's available. Let's see if I can kind of choose the mass floor. You can type anything you want in here. So if I want to put retail in there, I can. It's not going to look any different right offhand. I can make them look different, but they're not going to have a default different appearance. Maybe this one over here is office instead. But as I'm 
working with these mass floors, a very handy view that I want to get to using is something called the mass floor schedule. And that's just a really nice tabular view of all your mass floors. If you open up the view tab and choose to create a schedule, and then schedule the mass floors, they're actually one of the different things under mass you can schedule. You can say, oh, I want to put that level in there. And I'd like to go ahead and put the floor area in there. I can put usage in there. I can put some comments in there if I want to. I can really put all sorts of different things on that schedule if I want to. You'll see that it shows up as a relatively simple schedule by default, but then if I want to put some subtotaling and a grand total, for example, this is an okay looking table, but I might want to have a grand total seeing where we are overall. And maybe even subtotal it based on the different usage types. That way you can kind of keep track of how many retail, how much office we're creating. That all happens under two different tabs. Sorting and grouping is the one where we sort it. Let me go ahead and I'm going to sort it. Oh, primarily by usage, and then I'll do it by level name. And at the bottom of usage, I'm going to put some sort of footer in there. So the retail will be sorted out, and then the offices will come after. Our office will come before retail. Then level within there. I'm even going to put a little blank line in there. All that's doing is putting an extra little blank space between the different subsections just to help you read it a little bit easier. Then for the schedule, you just have to choose which of the different fields are the ones you want to calculate a total on. I'm just going to choose the floor area. So you can see that I have, oh, some square footage that's unallocated by usage, some that's allocated to office, some that's allocated to retail. And the reason I like working with this view is I can change things in this view very easily too. So if I type values in here, as opposed to selecting the objects individually in the 3D model, Oftentimes, it's a lot easier to go and edit these things like in this uh, view instead. So if it turns out level two is going to switch from retail to office, change it. You can sort of really quickly just juggle things around. I'm just changing the values here. So, so far, this is there's nothing new about what we've been doing so far. This is all pretty uh, kind of familiar territory. What we showed last time was the whole notion that you can take these conceptual mass forms and actually start turning into real building surfaces. And that's where it started getting sort of interesting. There's this whole notion of, I got some floors, mass floors there, I got some surfaces on the side, I got a surface on the top here. You know, if I want those to actually generate walls and building floors and like uh, roofs, I can use those. And that's all happening under massing in sight. So there's some choices right over here that are kind of interesting. They're right next to the creation of the in-place masses with these notions of creating a roof, creating a wall, creating a floor, a curtain system. Let's kind of take a look at them and just see what's available there. <laughs> floors is a real easy one. Most people get floors real quickly. If you choose the floors in the type properties, there's all sorts of different floor types available. These are the same exact floor types that are available if you're creating the floors by drawing footprints. Same ones. So if you need one here, go ahead and add it, duplicate the type, whatever it is. Yeah. The effect of creating a floor as a mass element is really, I'm not sure if there's really any distinction between doing that versus drawing it by doing the profile or editing the footprint. It really creates the same type of object. So these floors, since they're nice and horizontal, whether I make them lightweight concrete on a metal deck because I'm thinking about a steel structure or some sort of, uh, oh, wood. No, I'll go with lightweight metal. If I wanted a concrete in there, I should have put that in there. I can choose that floor. Actually, if I'm being good about it, those upper floors will probably be the lightweight metal deck with the concrete on top. The lower floor will probably be like a concrete slab, something like that. So if I'm being honest, these will probably be one type of floor. This lower one down here, oops, let me say floor there. I'll choose him. I don't really have a good concrete one. Let me edit the type and make that happen. Let's say I want like a concrete six inch slab as an example. It'll be six inches thick 
And if I'm really good, I'll even assign it to the cast in place concrete material because that'll make sure that it um, ultimately has the right thermal properties. It shows up in the right spot in any sort of scheduling and estimating software we're putting together. So I didn't have a six inch slab, but now I do. So I'll assign that type. Okay, so we're pretty good on the floors right now. Now the floors, the cool thing about them is, again, they really are just the same as though you had created them in uh, by drawing the boundaries. Well, I'll say they're 90% the same. There's one subtle distinction to them that I'll kind of uh, draw in just a second here. But if I want to edit the boundary, I can choose the floor and edit the boundary. So all my pink line rules, all my pink boundary line rules apply. If I want to cut away part of that floor, or put a hole in the floor, whatever it is I want to do to that floor, it'll work just the way I expect it to do. So for example, I'm going to cut away some corner over here because I have some idea of an atrium or a double story space between the second and third floors, the third and fourth floors. I can trim those up. Finish that. Okay, and that floor is now smaller. It's cut away that. The mass floors are still showing up, the purple part, but the real floor is really just in those areas. So editing the floors is pretty straightforward. That feels pretty good. Okay, walls, it turns out, are amazingly similar. Walls, you sort of get the hang of really easily, too. Actually, roofs are really easy also, but I'm going to leave the roof off now so we can sort of see what's going in. But roof, I would choose the roof tool. I would choose the type of roof, and I'd choose that on the top. Say make a roof. Well, maybe I'll leave it there. Okay, now these are real building elements, so even though we're looking at them in conjunction with the mass floors here, if I start doing things like I look at the floor plan views, for example, there's the level floor plan with that corner cut away. Here's level one and level two. They're all kind of looking okay. If I go through and look in the elevations, there really are building elements hanging around in here. Or even if I go through and cut a section now. So I say view, and I cut some section through my building at a kind of a funny angle. you'll see that the elements are truly here. Let me go ahead and in this view show you that if you ever just want to hide the mass temporarily, you can just go ahead and turn this off again. So now I'm only looking at the building elements. So it's kind of mass on, mass off. Back and forth. That'll work in really all the views. I should comment, it's not really strictly mass on, mass off. What it really is, is mass by view settings okay, versus mass always on. So it's I will show you the mass or I will defer to whoever you have your visibility graphics set up is really the way to look at that. So if, for example, I change this back to visibility graphics, I'll turn off the mass in this view. Turn that off right now. Okay, those are just the real building elements. Okay, so mass on, okay, versus just the building elements. Now, walls have a sort of an amazingly similar story to them. The walls are where it starts getting to be just a little bit tricky. Because as you're playing around with this whole system, if you created walls which are perfectly vertical, okay, Revit knows how to convert them into absolutely typical Revit walls that everything you know about walls will work just perfectly. Okay, so joining and trimming profiles and all these funny things we're used to sort of doing with walls that happen very automatically happen very nicely if the walls are perfectly vertical. You need to kind of curve horizontally, okay, but as long as they go straight up and down, everything's cool. Where it starts getting different and where we really need to use masses as opposed to generating walls using the typical building elements is as soon as those walls start having any sort of a slope to them. Because the deal is, Revit walls don't understand how to slope. Standard Revit walls just don't get that. The only way to generate a sloping wall or a curving wall, one that curves vertically, is to generate it as a form. There's no easy way to do that other than kind of making a form. So I can choose the wall material. 
I can choose, oh, some sort of nice wall over here, like this nice brick on metal studs, and I'll choose this wall over here. Maybe I'll choose this wall over here. Okay. Again, I'll come back over to Massing in Sight and turn that off, and you'll see that the brick walls are in here. Actually, I should be a little cautious about that. Let me kind of tell you about this. You see I have that little uh, nasty bleed through there where my floors are bleeding through the edges over there. And that's because I'm not being quite careful enough. Let me back on out there, and I'll take those two walls out. I'll turn that mask back on again. It turns out when you're placing walls, you also have the option of controlling the location line. And here's where I got myself in trouble right there. Right now the location line is set to finish face exterior, so it says use that boundary of the mass as the outer surface of the wall, the finished surface of the wall. And if I'd really, really have it has to be the core of the wall, so the brick is wrapping outside of that, I just need to adjust that. So let's fix that the first time through here. I'll say core face exterior, and I'll choose that, and choose that. And now these walls look a lot happier. So brick walls, but they look kind of nice and clean on the outside. And they really are the brick walls. If we go zoom it on in there close enough, you can see the real pattern of all those little bricks kind of hanging around in there. Now, as we go popping around, let me orbit around the building here a little bit. The other system that becomes available to us is the notion of a curtain system. And let's talk about that. Because I had a really good question at the beginning of the class about curtain systems versus curtain walls and really what the difference is between the two. And it's a pretty subtle distinction. If I choose curtain system, I can choose different surfaces. And when I say create a system, there's the curtain wall types over here. I can edit those types and make a new wall type. Okay. But if I choose curtain system, what happens that's, you know, you can think of either being very good or kind of annoying is that if I choose the system, I'm actually choosing both of the panels. See, they're both being selected because everything is considered part of the same system, including multiple wall segments. It's all going to change. It's considered to be one big object at this point. Now, let's talk about why you may or may not want to do that. If all these surfaces are so uniform that if I change anything about the pattern anywhere, I wanted to change on all those different surfaces, the curtain system's okay. It'll change them all. It considers it all just be part of, a, a part of an overall system. So for example, if I change these, I'm going to duplicate this and make some type that is 8 feet by 8 feet. And we'll say 8 feet in this direction, 8 feet in that direction. Okay. The whole system changed. Everything changed in that 8 by 8. Now, if you want everything to be kind of holistic that way, super. But what if you actually wanted it to be something a little more custom? For example, these kind of walls that are hanging out here, it's nice that I can make a whole big brick wall at once, but you know, I'd kind of like to put some doors and windows in there and some other things to give it a little more articulation, a little more savoir faire. So what I can do is go through and add things like uh, windows in here. I can go through and add things like doors in here. So I can add things to it. So just because it was generated with the form, don't think that you have to sort of live with it as like one giant blob. It really was just how you generated it. Okay? You still have the ability to control it after that. What I want to distinguish for you, though, is on this notion of the curtain systems. Let's go back over here. I'm going to actually remove the curtain system for right now. Take it back out. The mass is still there. And as opposed to doing that as a curtain system, let's think about doing those as curtain walls instead. And you say, oh, curtain wall is not available. I don't see curtain wall under the massing in sight menu. Okay. But you can go through and create walls. And amongst the wall types are curtain walls. 
Okay, notice they don't have the type that I defined. That's only in the curtain systems right now. But I can choose this one to be a curtain wall and that one to be a curtain wall. Let's think about why I might want to do that better or why I might want to do that instead. Okay, at some level, curtain walls and whatever, they're all made up of um, panels and mullions and grids and all that type of stuff. They're the same in that respect. I can change out an individual panel. For example, if I come on in here, I can choose an individual panel, even though it got generated you know, from the system. Let me unpin that. Notice it's pinned because it came out of the system. And I could load in a different window type. For example, oh, there's a window type, which is an operable curtain panel. So I can say Windows. And where is it? It's a curtain wall awning window. So I can choose that panel opening. Maybe I'll choose one in the middle somewhere. Unpin that. And I can change the type to be an awning window. There it is. Can I make it a window? I could change the panels to be uh, different types of opaque glass. I can change the image material. The fact that they got generated from a form doesn't stop you from being able to customize them. You have all the same customizing options available. Okay. But one nice feature in particular I want to draw your attention to is this whole notion, oh, if you don't want the entire face to be curtain wall, you can go through and if it's a curtain wall, not a curtain system, a curtain system applies to the entire face. Okay, But if it's a curtain wall, I can do things like, oh, splitting the wall. So for example, I can split that wall in half. And because I split that wall in half, I can choose just this half over here and maybe make that a brick wall. Or just some sort of difference between the two. So you have the ability to kind of customize. So the only thing to watch out for curtain systems is fewer options. They're more limited. Curtain systems can form the entire mass. You can keep this curtain walls. They all kind of work together. Now the cool thing about masses, if you do use masses to generate things, is if later on you decide to change your masses, like, in general, things will go through and adapt pretty nicely. So I'm just looking at the, the kind of naked side of it over here, just so I can choose that mass pretty easily. But if I say I want to edit that mass, let's see if I can grab it here. There's a face, actually the whole mass right now. Let's see if I can just kind of choose just the face of it. That's that face on the side over here. Here's the face. That's the top. That's the front face of it. If I, for example, pull that mass out, okay, which is really just reshaping the mass. The nice thing about the mass is, is they have this property where it doesn't happen right away. Notice the mass floors stretch. They always stretch the full boundary, but the floors you created didn't stretch just yet. And if you'd like the uh, boundary, uh, the objects that you've created to stretch, you can, for example, select them. Oh, say, grab some other ones in here. Let me choose that way. Uh, under this option, there's something called update to face. What update to face says? There's a mass face. You use that to generate an object. Update the face will say that if you've changed the object, it'll move the new surface that you created to match that face. So for example, that'll stretch the floor out. This will stretch this floor out. That'll stretch this floor out. Or more importantly, let's get that curtain wall. I'll update it to the face. It's going to complain a little bit about that, okay? It's going to have to do some remaking. I'll say that's okay. So it's going to pull it out to that other face too. This one's a little bit interesting over here. I'm not exactly quite sure what's going to happen to that one. We'll give it a try though and see. Oh, that's interesting. It understands the brick. Okay, but it's doing it across the entire face. So it's thinking that this other piece that I split off 
that's not giving me edit the face, so I'm going to have to split that again in terms of doing that. So think about this stuff creatively. The other thing I want you to think about in terms of these masses is that you know, we often use them when we want to create sort of a very, oh, a tangent surface, something that had a very unusual and interesting form to it. So let's go ahead and take out that face of the building and kind of think about some of the variations about what we have to worry about. So I'm going to go out and grab just that one face over here. Actually, see if I can grab the uh, whole mask because I want to edit the mask. There we go. Let me, oh, I'll create another view here. I keep on going to the, uh, that's interesting. I'm in the middle. It won't let me do that right now. Interesting. I won't create the view right now. What I wanted to show you is that we can stretch, uh, for example, that face on out. I was going to hide the building elements so we can see that a little bit clearer. It'll finish that mass. Okay, this one over here, I'm just going to update it so it matches that slopey shape. But this is the surface I wanted to take, pay some attention to. That sloping surface. I've been saying, oh, if it makes sense to go ahead and do it as a real wall, and just trace it right on the boundary. If you want to do it by casting it as part of the mass, you can do it that way. And that is so generally true. Even I'll grab this one back over here. I'm going to fix that while I'm back here. You. I'll update you to the face. Oh, that's interesting. They're no longer vertical. Okay. Well, I'll do that. When I stretched it, if I think about how that corner got stretched out, ooh, can you see what happened there? I actually got a little torque to the whole thing there. Hmm. That's kind of a particularly interesting face right now. That's actually curved. Okay, so we'll get to that one in a minute. I got this big sloping face. The sloping face is one there was no way I could create that normally with Revit. It just isn't going to happen. I have to go through and generate it some way like this. Okay. And it's okay to generate it like this. We talked a little bit last time about this whole notion that it creates a little work for us if we want to join walls to it because we have to edit the profiles and kind of make them join oh, somewhat manually. But I can go through and uh, make a curtain wall out of that. It doesn't like that. Actually, for this sloping face, I may actually have to switch it over and be storefront. That may be one of the differences between the two. Let me say massing and Site. I might have to make it a curtain system. Okay, that's another distinction. For the slope, I guess storefront doesn't work on a non vertical face. A curtain wall doesn't work on a non vertical face. Vertical face. A curtain system does. So, limiting in that it's all one object and you can't edit it very well, but powerful in that I can make it on a sloped or a curved face in a way that a normal curtain system can't be. Maybe I'll put one of those over here too. In fact, if I wanted to be separate, I could do the same sort of thing here. Again, massing in sight, curtain system, make that face. Now that's actually a particularly interesting face you might notice. You see what's going on there? That's not strictly rectangular. Actually, what it's going through and doing, it's still twisting and contorting and it's taking a basic grid pattern and just dividing it up across the face, trying to create regular and even increments there. And that's often what we have to do on buildings that have these organic facades and things are curving and sloping and doing all these kind of very unusual sort of uh, geometric things. Is you can't actually get a giant piece of glass to go through and have that degree of curvature. What we tend to do is divide up and panelize the entire system so that we can approximate the curve with a number of very flat panels. And that's good enough. That actually is how we do most big buildings now. So, yeah, as you look at all those incredibly like, articulated, panelized systems, it's not just kind of really interesting to look at. We're doing that so that we can take a complex pattern and reduce it to a series of flat panels, because that's just really the limitation of our construction technology today. Okay. Now, for these curtain systems, or for the space over here, let's take a look at what's going on right here. 
What system type did I put in there anyway? Zoom out. Did I put the 8 by 8 in there? Yep. I put in the 5 by 10. Let's go ahead and change that. I'm going to make them a little bit taller, the 8 by 8 system. The reason being, I actually want to be able to put some like uh, doors and windows in this thing. But something you may recognize about this kind of system, let me orbit it around. This kind of curtain panel over here, you have no trouble putting doors and windows in. You know what to do to this guy over here. If you want to go through and put some sort of door in there or a window in there, you can choose a panel. I'm choosing that panel. I'll unpin it for just a second. And if I want to put a window in there, like a glazed window type or a different type of panel, I'll just choose that different pipe type of window. It'll replace it right into the system. If I want to put a door in there, again, we know what to do. You just have to load in the right door type and replace the panel. And again, it always confuses me. I really hate the fact that I have to go to door and load in a door. And I go to the doors over here and I say it's a curtain wall double glass and it says door, door, door everywhere. Okay. But now when it comes time to place it, it's not a door. It's a panel instead. So let me do this. I'm going to grab that mullion and take him out. I'll take that grid right there. I want to put a nice double door in here. See if I can grab the grid. I'll remove a segment from the grid. And now I can go through and choose that panel and replace that. Again, unpinning it to be, oops. There it is, curtain wall double glass. Double panel door. So curtain panels are really okay. They're pretty, you know, they work the way you expect. Here's a situation that a lot of people get into and they wonder what to do. And we'll talk about it not only from a modeling standpoint, but also just kind of a, a ration and reason and logic sort of standpoint. You got this big sloping panel over here. You want to put a door in that panel. Okay, because you do. You want to have some people with ability of people to get in there. The problem with putting a door in that panel, I can tell the smiles in some of your faces, is floors are all here, that's all looking fine. If you put a door in that vertical sloping wall, you know, it's a really hard door to operate. It's either going to flop open or you're going to be pushing it uphill. Like, that actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense to put a door in there, and it's really more architecturally than it is even from a modeling standpoint. It's just a really hard space to put a door right there. So, if you have a big old sloping surface or a big curvaceous surface, same thing. It's hard to put a door in a curving wall. What you often have to do is actually just kind of create a little vertical surface to work with temporarily to put the door in that might notch in or might kind of come out. So I got this big vertical surface. I want to go through and put that door in there. So what can I do? I can go through and, oh, I can take put some little alcove into the building where I create a perfectly vertical surface. And then I can put the door here. So this is like a section cut to the building. And the door can open in here. So I can kind of cut into the building to make that happen. The other way some people will use is if they don't want to cut into the building, they'll actually sort of build out some sort of vestibule on the outside. And it'll have a nice roof on it, maybe a canopy. But there'll be something you enter that is more vertical, and then you get into the sloping surface that way. Okay, so how do you go through and model something like that relative to our big sloping surface here? Because you'd like those two things to sort of work smartly together. So let's take a look at that. And that'll be the last thing we sort of do with playing around with masses for a little bit. So I got this big, fantastic sloping surface. Everything's looking good. I want to actually be able to kind of either cut in or add out to that surface. And I'd like to do it in sort of a smart way. Because one of the problems with this big massing and surface thing going on over here was I can build out some little walls, but I actually need to get rid of the glass wall behind, too. I can't just build up the new walls. I have to kind of get rid of the other thing. I have to have some sort of smart intersection. So here's how you do it. Let me go ahead and, oh, let me do this as long as I'm in here now. Duplicate that. 
I'm going to call this view my mass only. And why am I doing this? It's just because it's easier to operate on the mass sometimes if you only see that. So I'm going to say visibility graphics of this view. I'm just going to select everything and turn it all off. And then the only thing I'm going to show is the masses. Okay, so a little cleaner. So what I want to do is actually have something that either adds in or cuts out. And they work in a sort of a very similar way. If I take that mass and I edit that mass, it turns out your forms could actually be made up of several pieces. Everything doesn't have to be decided by just a single profile or a couple profiles. You can add to it. And to do that, you can do things like this. For example, if I want to go through and I'll draw on level one, have something that's basically adding out. I can draw something like that. It's just a profile now. Let me make it into a nice solid piece of form. Pull it on up. It's actually intersecting. Can you see that? It's actually kind of cutting between those two different things. Now, okay, so far so good. I got this thing poking out. I got the big sloping wall behind it. They're sitting there side by side, but they're not quite aware of each other yet. They don't quite understand how this intersection is going to work. And what we finally need to do is actually join the two things together. When you join them, it'll figure out what the intersection and the boundary line of that intersection is and be smart about it. So what I can do is use this join tool to choose one object, choose the other object, and it does the smart thing. Okay. So the nice thing about this little chunk right now, if I finish my mash, you'll see, is if I go back to the 3D view where that little chunk is hanging out, okay, it hasn't updated yet. It hasn't figured out that it needs to update, but if I choose it and say update to face, it's actually going to honor that hole and cut away the glass where it shouldn't be. So it's taking care of that intersection. The positive sense, oh, the mass floors are in here. Let me kind of hide those so you're not having to look at them. They're obscuring what I want to show you here. Oh, it's because I have this still turned on. Okay, yeah, that glass form is cut away right there. And that's going to be good because then I can show that form again. I can use the same sort of tools, whether it's curtain wall. I probably go for wall first, just because that's sort of the simple one. I can add these things. Let me hide that again. It's ready to put a roof on it, but it's doing the right thing in terms of how those things should intersect. And now I can put a door in this little vestibule with things popping out there. So adding on as a form is actually a very valid thing to do if you have these either curvy surfaces or sloping surfaces. Yes, that's a very valid way to approach it. There are some things like doors that just have to resolve themselves nicely vertically. You know, windows, well, I'll take this back. The model would let you put a sloping door in there. It would let you change a sloping panel to a door panel. Yeah, it doesn't care. So for example, I could go through, let's see if I can grab it. Oh, maybe not as a storefront system. Let's see if I can grab this. Okay, there's this nice sloping panel. It'll let me put a double door in there. That's just gonna be a really hard door to open. So the panel, it's not gonna stop you from doing it. Okay, but your common sense is gonna stop you from doing that. Windows, though, they're, they're actually a little more fluid in terms of what's going on. You know, you can actually imagine having an operable window on a sloping face like that. So if you want to go through and put some sort of awning window in there, that's actually okay. It's a little hard to operate. Maybe it needs some motor controls or something like that. But uh, that's actually possible to handle, handle something like that. So adding out one way you can handle this situation. 
The other way I want to show you is, if you don't want to add out, you can actually cut in instead. And cutting in is very similar. So I go to the back to the mass only. There's my little added out mass. Okay, cutting in. What do we do with cutting in? Cutting in is going to look amazingly similar. I'm going to go through and choose that mass and edit it. Okay, so we're hanging out over here. We're going to again draw some shape. So this time I'm going to draw a shape and I can start on the outside if I want to, but I'm going to make sure it cuts back into the building. The difference between adding out and cutting in is just every form actually has a type. Let me show you that. I don't usually talk about that very much. Every form has a type. This is called subcategory form. No, there it is. No, think about where you can actually see that. Because different forms, some are solid, some are uh, voids. When I create a form, I can choose whether it's a solid form or a void form. If you choose a void form, okay, it creates an orange box instead. Okay, and that'll cut away form instead. So it just cuts a void out of there. I don't tend to use voids very much, actually. Voids are a little bit harder to control. For me, it's a little bit harder to control. There's the void form. Actually, what I really want to do is get that void form face. That could be a trick. Actually, now my eyes are playing a trick on me about which way is up and which way is down. Because <laughs> I'm underneath it. <laughs> Same thing. It's an optical illusion. Okay, I gotta stay focused on the right surface. It's this grayish surface at the top. I can pull that down and kind of stretch the void or kind of bring it down a little bit if I want to. The only thing you know need to know about voids that is all sort of different or funny as you work is this. Let's see if I can actually demonstrate it. If I am creating a mass, and I take something that I'm doing out here, like this, and I create a void form out of it. Okay. Let me orbit that around a little bit. And then I move that mass. Hard time even grabbing it. The mass. Oh, it's interesting. Can I not move it once it's doing its thing? It should be under here somewhere. There it is. There's my move tool. You just can't see it all because there's so much going on. I got a mass. I just sort of bumped it right into that big solid system over there. And you notice it didn't void it. Hmm. That's kind of strange. A little confusing to me. Let's go ahead and do something else. I'm going to take a very similar sort of thing. I'm going to draw sort of a shape right over here. I'm going to create a uh, void form out of that. Okay, it does cut it out. Okay. Anyone want to speculate as to what the rule is about whether it's going to cut it out or not cut it out? Don't be shy. There are no wrong answers here. What's different about the way I do those two different things? It was created touching the actual. You are so right. That is it. Thank you. Really. You see it right. You see right through my trick here. It's really all about if I create a void and it's touching the other object when you create it, it understands what you're trying to void against. It's implicit, so it just does it automatically. This guy over here, although he's touching now, it wasn't created touching, so it doesn't quite understand what it should void against. Now, that could be useful to you or painful to you, depending on like uh, how you're trying to do your modeling. If I choose, oh, let me do the joining thing here over again, or I can do cutting too. I can cut two solids, or I could join a void to a solid. Since I already have a void I'm going to join, 
I could join that and I could join, if I can do this, nope, I have to do it with a cut. I guess it's considered a cut that way. Okay, you can, you can bring them together later. You can sort of tell it what the relationship is if you have to get that in there later. Okay, so again, why do we show you all these variations? It's only because we're trying to just help you understand oh, the flexibility as well as some of the, the nuance of how you have to sort of control things a little bit more finely if you're trying to use mass forms to dictate very interesting forms. So let's think about this you know, relative to your assignment and what you have to do. Okay, you're going to be given sort of the basic program with a certain amount of space and you say, hey, go ahead and come up with some interesting form shape for you know, what the building can look like, do an energy analysis, and ultimately render that shape. You're going to start out with something very simple like that. In terms of thinking about this, you can create sort of a very simple shape like some of the shapes that we've seen here because the point isn't necessarily that you're going to create some incredibly organic, unusual shape. The point is that you can use the masses as a tool for helping you with doing the conceptual energy analysis and helping to create the form and try different shapes and sizes relatively quickly. Okay, so the point is that you can create a building that looks like the one in the background there. Let me update that there. And then once you've created that, my building's not exactly complete, but we'll go ahead and start. I can take that and I can go through and, oh, let's go through and put a camera in there. I'll put a camera down on level one, sort of facing my fabulous new entrance to the building. View, camera. I got my 3D view of the building. Not very exciting right now, but it's enough to get us going. So you're going to explain your design of the building to me. As opposed to just shading it, you can actually go through and do a rendering of it really easily where I can go through and let me zoom that to fit. Oh, say let's go ahead and render that right in Revit. I can render it. Since it's an exterior rendering, it'll go very, very quickly because it's just that sunlight. It's a very fast calculation. I can even get up to like a medium quality or something like that what kind of sky I want, whether I want some clouds in there or not, or put some sort of other background in there. Let's just render that. And to the extent that you've assigned nice materials, it'll go through and give you a pretty good rendering. Kind of an interesting aspect of it, that sloping plane right now, it only has glass to it. It doesn't have any mullions to it. So we'd have to add some mullions if you actually want to be able to see those. But you can go through and either render right within Revit. I'm going to go ahead and I'll orbit around to a different view. That might be a little bit more interesting from that perspective. Again, it probably helped if I put a little ground plane in here or something like that. But again, I'll just render this. Again, you just cannot go along, wrong with exterior rendering. So it's very, very quick and easy. You can either render them right within Revit. There's the brick, a couple windows. That's interesting. I thought there were mullions over on the side. I guess that's just the glass panels. Let's see if I can actually put some millions on there. That's bothering me. You need some millions. Okay, and same thing over on the other side. Again, I would like to have some millions on this side. So let me put them in here. Okay, that'll look for a bit, uh, look uh, better as a rendering now. So again, rendering over here. So the fact that it got generated from a form, don't treat that as it's not a mysterious thing that makes things unavailable. It's really just a Kickstarter to help you get going. 
and you can still use all your kind of pretty typical rivet techniques for getting going or to continue to completing it. So that looks better. Maybe I'll put a ground plan out here for some concrete where the landscaping is. I can put some trees in here. I can just have all sorts of fun in terms of kind of really making this look a little bit better as the rendering goes. Actually, the rendering did sort of an interesting thing there. Let me go back to that for a second. You'll see that even inside, oh, where the sun is shining in, you're starting to see it's the shadow of the mullions on the floor. That's really what you're starting to see there. I don't have that surface floor down on there. When I want to save a rendering, what I can do is save it to the project. And then that snapshot actually shows up down here in the project browser so you can get to it again pretty quickly. So now, this is a pretty naked rendering. I'm not quite happy with this right yet, just yet. I might go through and add some more components to it. I can say, oh, let's load a family. There's a really good family. Oh, actually, those are all them. Got to think about where my plantings went. They move them every session. Site components, RPC trees. Hmm. So if I want to put some poplar trees around, okay. or what else could I put in here? Let's go back to architecture, or massing inside. See what else I got going on. These are mostly trees. Put some crab apples in there. Okay, if I'd like to put some other components, there's a really cool folder where I was going in the first place with someplace called Entourage. And let me show you what some of the nice pieces are out there. In Entourage, you'll find, oh, things like a beetle, a semi truck, or a van. Interesting. I'll go for the little beetle, the Volkswagen beetle for right now. I think some of you guys use this in the uh, second assignment. Put a couple of them parked out front. Or even one of my favorite RPC commons to work with, this is so dorky, is you might remember when I was looking at some interior renderings, there were little people that showed up. And here they are. There's the male and the female character. If you choose the male character, you can put a couple guys kind of hang around out front. So let's go down and take a look at these guys. They actually have different names. <laughs> and the names actually are sort of a reflection of their personalities and actually their ethnicity, I'm afraid you admit. So Alex, Dwayne, Jay, and Laurent all have slightly different appearances to them. <laughs> okay, so we'll have Alex over here. Talking to Leron, and I don't make this stuff up. I just use it. Now, if I want them to talk, they're actually sort of facing away from each other. I'm going to kind of rotate them around. So Leron's kind of facing us right now. Alex is sort of facing us too. Let me rotate him around. There's actually a little point. Actually, I may have that wrong. A little hard to see in 3D. That point at the tip, that's actually where they're facing right now. So if I want him to face over here, and I want Laurent to face over there, okay, now they're looking like they have a conversation. Now it wouldn't be complete if we didn't get some of the gals in here too. So we'll load in some of the gals. And we have Cynthia, who's very prim and proper. She's wearing a business suit and looking like she's already for business. We have Florence, Lisa, Kathy, and she's rolling off the bottom there. There she is. Yinyin. Yinyin's wearing a sarong and she's ready for a luau. She's just all ready to go. So here's you out, Yinyin. We'll throw her into the mix too. So I'll rotate Yinyin around. So she's going to get involved in the conversation. And we are, again, ready to go. Kind of zoomed in close. Let me pull on out a little bit. So it seems kind of dorky what I've been doing. I've just been sort of setting the stage, dressing it for uh, some action. Right now, there's still no ground plane. I should probably put a ground plane in here. 
But when I want to render, what I can do is again, come back in, let's say render. It should go pretty quick because again, it's all about the number of sources of light. And the sun is such a single, nice, big, bright, single source of light. It just calculates very, very quickly. It'll be a little bit longer because there's more surfaces, all those trees and their leaves and stuff like that. There's more surfaces. So that looks a little bit better. We actually have the grill on the front or the mullions on the front of it. Those little Volkswagens. You see my little teeny tiny people there. It's kind of hard to get the perspective on what they're looking like. So let me even create a different view, but that's kind of a reasonable exterior rendering. Again, let me go back out here. If I want to save that rendering, I can say save it to the project. And that's probably a little bit better. It's nice to have the trees in there and stuff like that. It gives you a little bit of context. The building doesn't look quite so naked. But if I would like to actually get, oh, I always like what I'll call ground level renderings. It's the kind of rendering when you, it looks like you're walking up to the building and things are happening in the background. So what I want to do is have something more like, oh, I'm going to kind of come up on my uh, gang of folks here. Have that building in the background. Let's see what that looks like. So there they are in front of the building. The big imposing. It looks very big and imposing right now, doesn't it? Hmm. Don't hardly have any, hardly any of the trees. There's some trees in there. Again, this will look better with a ground plane. But let's zero, ZF it, zoom it in. Let us show some rendering. I'll just leave it at medium for now. Again, it'll first go through and compute the amount of light, then it'll go back and figure out what the surfaces look like with the light on them. So it takes a couple passes. You can see through the building, I can see the brick on the back wall. I can even see the little windows and the doors on the back wall. I can get a very good view of Laurent and Yinyin having their conversation over here. I'm disappointed by that. So let me adjust that a little bit so you can. Hmm, what do I want to do? And again, this is all staging. I should, you could either move them around or move things around, but you are telling a story. So make sure you're telling the story however you'd like it to be told. If you want it to look like a happy space where people hang out, put some happy people in there. So again, we'll say render it. Okay, let that run through. Okay, here comes the building in the background. Again, if I had better materials, we can make the building look a little bit more realistic. It's not doing too awfully bad. Now, this issue of the rendering time, it's actually starting to add up just a little bit. But, so if you didn't want to do it here in your own machine, you could just send this off to the cloud and let it render it there. The JPEG will come back to you later. Okay, so here we have, here's Yin Yin. She's all ready for the party. She's thronged out. Here's Moran. He's carrying his school books. Looks like he's heading off to like a class. Oh, is this Alex or Dwayne? I never remember. He's kind of wearing oh, khakis. He's, he's, he's heading towards the, the, the Young Entrepreneurs Club meeting, something like that. But uh, you can make up your own story about how these people all relate together. And there's really quite a bit of a, like, you know, or what I say, you know, thought that goes in for people who do this type of rendering. They, they put a fair amount of care into the whole notion of how you go through and construct uh, these kinds of renderings. Actually, I just barely and accidentally got something to happen here, which is often effective do use 
Like you got the building in the background, the people were kind of in the middle ground. A little bit of a tree hanging out in the foreground, which is starting to set up just a little bit of context, guys. Yeah, and that actually, oh, it gives us sort of a good visual quality. You like the things to be in the foreground, in the middle ground, and in the background, because you're really just trying to set a stage and tell an entire story. So the whole notion is, where you are going for your next assignment is, you're creating the building, you're kind of doing it uh, using some forms to sort of figure out the overall shape and do some energy analysis to figure out what size it is. And you're going to go through and make it into some form like this that has a skin of the whole building, ultimately rendering it and then pulling it together. So there's going to be variations on that theme. That's the gist of it. But as you're doing this, again, these sorts of buildings are A-OK. -okay. What you don't need to be doing is this. And I tell you that, which means immediately, oh, like uh, 10 of you will try to do this just because you know, you can, and it's a challenge, and you want to sort of go and maximize this to the ultimate degree. You don't have to, but you can, and I show you this because, oh, it's just always useful to know what you can do. You don't have to go through and create, oh, incredibly complex forms, like I'm going to put a circle down there, up on level three, I'm going to go ahead and put some ellipse over here. Oh, I'm on level one, so I can't see it. That makes sense. <coughs> I'll do it in 3D so I can actually see it all the way through. Okay, there's the ellipse. Oh, and then at the top of this building, uh, I'll go ahead and kind of make it, again, some slightly broader circle. I'll do that at level five, though. So you can use a technique like this to create kind of incredibly organic shapes. Things that, oh, I can grab these different profiles and loft them all together, make a nice solid form out of those. That's actually an incredibly complex shape right now in terms of the curvature of all those different things and trying to blend them all together. And as you're going through and creating complex shapes like that, you can go through and, although there's kind of two big chunks to it, we can start to try to control this and make some wall surfaces, like I'll make a nice brick wall. We'll put on this side. Maybe I'll make some nice curtain system that I'll put on the other side. So a curtain system over here, I'll put it on this side. Okay. And there is no denying this is sort of a really interesting shape and a profile. It'll render nicely and, you know, it's kind of a very interesting building to think about. But you don't need to go there in terms of this, because for what we want to do, in terms of just trying to create just a basic notion of space, and then you do the energy analysis, although you can do this, don't feel obligated to, okay? Because if you do do something like this, it's just a lot more work for you. And you should think about how much time and energy you want to put into this between now and next Tuesday. Okay, so, uh, you know, know it's available, maybe you'll play with this over Thanksgiving break, or something like that, exploring that beautiful, perfect, organic form but you don't need to do actually the assignment. Okay, make sense? Beautiful. Okay, it's about a quarter to seven. Do you want, guys want to take like a five minute break or how are you doing? Five minutes? Okay, why don't you do that? I'm sorry, I keep on running. I'm, I'm all over the place about time. Why don't you go ahead, take a break, come on back in five, and we will continue looking at building systems and how we actually fill in one of these buildings with the systems, making sense of it at the next level. <laughs>